Thank you. So today, event generators are generally taken for granted. There's hardly any LSE analysis that's been done without it relying on generators to one extent or another. And uh, it's for a number of reasons. I mean, if you have a generator and you combine it with a model for your detector, then you can not only understand your signal, but also your background. Uh, including things like smearing and acceptance corrections, uh, aspects that you normally don't think of in terms of a perturbative calculation, like, for instance, underlying events, pile up, and stuff like that. So, so this is cl clearly uh, something that's quite useful. Uh, as uh, introduction terminology, when I speak about Monte Carlo, I, I mean just that you use random numbers to either draw from a distribution or integrate a distribution, often both at the same time. If you want to kind of have a cross-section for a process that you want to simulate, of course, you can do the integration at the same time as you generate the event according to it. Uh, an event generator is really a collection of different recipes, prescriptions for different steps of the evolution from a hard interaction to a complete final state with lots of particles and could involve you know, hundreds of different recipes. And then, as I say, very often you want to complement that by a detector simulation program where you keep track of what happens after the primary particles have been produced and the particles then are traversing a detector. But that also in itself contains interactions. So sometimes you can actually reuse your hard process generator also to deal with interactions inside the detector material. Now, if you want to put some kind of starting date to the whole game, 1960 is good as any. That was when the so-called M generator was introduced. Uh, this is a recursive way of handling n-body phase space where you kind of pick off one particle at a time. Each time you do that, you get one mass for the leftover system. So in this case here, that would be, uh, so to speak, that you pick off the lowest particle, then you remain with the mass of the three top particles, and then you pick up the the one here, and you remain with just the two-body phase space. In each step, you need to specify a mass, and then two angles, which are isotropic, so that's no problem. So with that as a starting point, you can, in fact, do sensible calculations. And one such example is the uh, study of jet production at Spear. Uh, there we, or the people there, used two different models to model the data. One is just isotropic phase space, as I just described. The other is the same, but you assume there is some preferred jet axis, and particles are suppressed for having a large transverse momentum with respect to that axis. So you have two models, you compare them, and what you see is that, in fact, the data clearly favor a model with a two-jet structure, whereas an isotropic phase space is clearly disfavored. So this is in itself is a nice and interesting observation. You can then go on and study the angular distribution of this jet axis. And you have this one plus alpha cos square theta. And experimentally, you then observe a value 0.45. Now the question is, what does that mean in real life? So there are several problems. One is that the sphericity axis is not the same as the original QQ bar axis. So you have some smearing in that step. But then on top of that, you also have a detector that really doesn't cover 4 pi. And you have all kinds of uh, you know, particles that you miss or mismeasure or whatever. So clearly, that's the smearing. But thanks to this kind of modeling, you can find a corrected value. And you can happily conclude that quarks, at least as produced V plus and minus, has been a half. So I think this is you know, a nice way of illustrating how you, in fact, can use only simple models to kind of draw very interesting conclusions. But if you want to go on to more sophisticated models, we come to the string. We've heard lots of that today and yesterday, so I shouldn't say much about it. Here it's, again, just a simple one plus one dimensional representation of some color flux tube. 
uh, which correspond to a linear potential with empirically uh, string tension of 1 GV per Fermi. And in the simple case of massless quarks, we just have a simple oscillatory motion. That was the starting point for the first, which I would call semi-realistic fragmentation model, which also then was a code even if it was never published. Uh, and in that, you just look at the first oscillation of, of a QQ bar pair, and you assume that the string has the same properties everywhere. So there is a fixed probability per unit area that the string will break there. But then, if you kind of then imagine a number of string breaks potentially happening, of course, nothing can happen in a region where the string is already broken. If we look at the first string break, uh, okay, sorry, uh, down here, that break by itself will mean that you get one string on that side and another string on that side, and the whole point of these breaks here will never happen because they are in the forward region of bond existing. So you keep on doing that, and you find that actually in this particular case, there are only four hadrons produced by three separate breaks. And of course, it's easy to see that then what you have is an exponential dampening factor for particles being produced uh, at some given invariant time squared. And you also find that on the average, you then have some kind of uh, uh, hyperbola of constant invariant time where most of the particles are being produced. The drawback of this particular model, well, there are many, but uh, the obvious one is that it gives you a continuous mass spectrum. So it's not, you know, discrete hadrons being produced the way you would think of it. And also another problem was that these very, uh, you know, good people were not good at communicating and the model was not kind of known to many people even. So the, uh, the kind of big breakthrough for Monte Carlo event generation was really the field Feynman model of 1978. Clearly another class of making uh, their results known. Um, there you uh, use a uh, recursive procedure starting from the tip of the jet, I mean with highest energy quark jet, and then you assume that behind that highest energy quark jet, you produce new quark anti quark pair. You can that way split off a hadron. You can specify which flavors it has, transverse momentum, longitudinal momentum. And then you remain off with another quark at the tip of the jet or of the remaining jet. And then again, you split off and keep going. This, is, in fact, is a very good prescription for a single jet. It has the problem that it doesn't conserve energy momentum or flavor or color or things like that, because clearly you can't do that from one single quark. Uh, also, somewhat surprising, these people didn't really understand how to make sense of that from a space-time point of view, because they kind of were aware that particle production should begin in the, mini in the middle, and yet they were now proposing a model that started at the end. So um, there were problems with it, but it was very useful. And uh, of course, at Petra, which was starting up at the time, it was used to study two jet events, two back-to-back -back jets, but also in particular to study three jet events, where they then assumed that you would have uh, three uh, patterns uh, going out, so you each quark or gluon would then produce hadrons around its axis with some kind of transverse momentum spread, uh, but basically along the respective axis. And those models were good enough to help establish that the structures observed at uh, Petra were in fact consistent with three jet production according to QCD, which some would say is then the discovery of the gluon. Uh, furthermore, one could look at the uh, structure of those events and see that uh, if you used a, a vector model for the gluon, then the angular distributions of jets is well described. Uh, whereas if you assume that the gluon had spin zero, you would not describe the angular distributions. 
So that's again something that illustrates the usefulness of generators that you can match two different scenarios and see which one works. However, as I said, there are problems with the field Feynman approach, the independent fragmentation approach. And another approach being developed was then the Ludden model, where you again have something very close to the Artrui-Menessier model, where you say that the string is stretching out, it breaks by new QQ bar pass, and out of that arises a set of hadrons. Uh, the difference, the big difference being that in this case here, you're allowed to uh, produce the hadrons on shell, which really means that this kind of constant uh, product decay probability per unit volume or per unit area is no longer true. Nevertheless, you can still fix it in such a way that you have a constant probability or a preferred production along a hyperbola invariant time and also an exponential decay in invariant time. Furthermore, it was noted here that uh, each of these decay vertices, in fact, have a spatial separation. So the order of time is not really a big problem. They're all independent of each other. So you're perfectly happy to start uh, working from the end of the string with the first hadron out here, like in the field Feynman model, and then work yourself inwards. But of course, in this particular case here, when you have two jets, it's clear that they have a continuity, so you have a continuous uh, set of hadrons with fixed flavors and so on and so forth. So, so the problems inherent in a single jet don't exist any longer. The big step, however, is that you can move on and study more complicated topologies like the uh, uh, QQ bar gluon events. And in particular, if you go to a number of colors going to infinity, then the gluon has a distinct color and anticolor that are not the same. So we can really think of the flow of color as being one color line connecting the quark with the gluon and another colored line then connecting the gluon with the antiquark. And in particular, there is no direct connection between the quark and the antiquark. And this has consequences for how particles are distributed in phase space. So it's no longer the case, like in the independent fragmentation, that particles are kind of symmetrically produced around a jet axis. Instead, they are boosted uh, in, the direction, in the regions where you have strings being drawn and boosted away from the QQ bar region. And that's then what was observed by Jade, that actually uh, you have less production between the Q and Q bar than you would have expected if particle production were symmetric around the jet axis. Unfortunately, at the time, Tasso tried to repeat the analysis and didn't see this phenomenon. So there was a lot of confusion, which then uh, grew when Cello two years later pointed out that depending on whether you used the uh, Lund framework or the earlier Phil Feynman based independent fragmentation frameworks, you got different answers for what alpha strong value you needed to have the correct three jet rate. And the underlying reason for all of this is that, as I said, a single particle, a single jet it's not conserving energy momentum consistently. You have to combine them together. And particularly, you have to take into account that the massless pattern has turned into a massive jet. And in the Lun model, this is kind of taken into account by the fact that particle production in a quark jet is asymmetric, tilted towards the gluon direction. This means that both quark and anti-quark jet axes are tilted to be more back-to-back, -back, which means that three-jet events become more two-jet-like. Whereas in the Hoyer model, they explicitly preserved all the three-jet directions and then need to rescale the momenta in all of them. And that turns out on the average to mean that some energy is taken from the quark and anti-quark jets and given to the gluon jet. So you get a three-jet event that's in fact more three-jet-like than you started out with. 
So that was one confusion. Then on top of that, we had, thanks to Keith and company, a calculation of uh, the next leading order QQ bar, gluon rate, and a leading order for jet rate. And unfortunately, at the time, there were also then people at uh, DESI who tried to repeat that calculation and came up with a somewhat different answer. So the whole field was very complicated for a while. Uh, fortunately, it turned out that Tasso found that they'd made a mistake. There was a bug in the analysis. So at the end of the day, all the uh, Petra collaborations agreed that the string model was there. And the complaints about the uh, next leading order calculation also died away. So if you look at uh, studies from, say, 84, 85 onwards, then all event shapes that are studied in E plus E minus are based on the existence of a string effect and are based on the ERT uh, jet calculation. So far, so good. Uh, and just as an addendum, I should then say that when you go on to LEP, then it becomes possible to also study four jet events and to confirm that uh, those topologies are consistent with the color factors that you, you have in QCD. So I would say with that, you have finally established everything you want from, from the theory. Now, taking a step back, as an alternative to the matrix element calculations, you can also think about partner showers. And those, of course, are based on the DGLAP equations, uh, and there are many people that have been working on that in, in different connections. Uh, so the DGLAP equations then describe how one part and branches into two, and then you repeat that recursively. Uh, the key role is played by the pseudo core form factor, the no emission probability, which you then get just by the exponentiation of the uh, emission probability. Uh, the first shower program that I'm aware of was written by a certain Stephen Rolfram, who then went on to do other things, uh, not public again. Uh, and then another number of other people also presented algorithms. Uh, but the, uh, and, and I should say that in these early days, there was some ambiguity about what the Q square evolution variable should be. You have different possible choices. You could use mass square, you can use uh, PT square, you can use angle squared, and all of those in principle have the same coverage of phase space in a naive sense. However, they order the emissions in a different way. You span the phase space in a different order. And that means that the showers at the end of the day are not equivalent. Uh, so the big step by Marcusine and Weber in 83 was then that they wrote a shower where they explicitly picked angle as evolution variable. And with that, they can then ensure that soft glue and destructive interference is correctly taken into account. So that's then a shower that has been with us and has been used and is still used today with minor modifications. However, it's not the only alternative and I'll, I'll come to that later on. Uh, but first, with the introduction of a shower, in fact, it becomes possible to have an alternative fragmentation model to the stringy one, and that's a cluster model. Uh, it's based on this pre-confinement property that Gabriele already mentioned. Uh, that if you think inside a the shower, then again, if you have some kind of number of colors going to infinity limit, then one color line typically tends to end up close in momentum space. So if you, uh, in particular in Herwig, force all final state gluons to branch into QQ bar pairs, then this whole system splits conveniently into smaller subsystems, and uh, you can trace each particular color line and find how it connects together into one single cluster. Now, if that cluster has a small invariant mass, you just let it decay to two particles and you're done. If it has a somewhat bigger invariant mass, you define some kind of jet axis by the endpoints, and you do a break into two smaller mass clusters, possibly repeated recursively, until you have small enough objects that you can let them decay into two particles. 
And by the color flow and by the boost, you get something equivalent to the string effect, namely that particles tend to end up in between the high momentum patterns in the process. Uh, so over the years, strings and clusters have been evolving. Unfortunately, as you try to describe more and more different hadron species, more and more different baryon species, so on and so forth, you tend to introduce more and more materials, constants, uh, masses, and uh, different stuff like that. So unfortunately, uh, even though you start out with a simple picture in either of the two cases, when you come to the end of the day when you want to describe the production of hundreds of different particle species, you also have a lot of parameters. Tough luck. Um, now, uh, an amusing aspect of the, uh, the string model was that, in fact, the Leningrad group uh, didn't believe in it. They thought this was something that was just kind of a fluke or behavior of non-perturbative physics. So they wanted to study it from a perturbative point of view. And then they studied the radiation of a soft gluon around a QQ bar gluon configuration. And to their big surprise, they actually found that also in perturbation theory, you get a nice picture where you have a quark gluon, an anti-quark gluon dipole for the soft gluon radiation. And then you have a negative contribution, color suppressed, for the quark anti-quark one, which to first approximation can just be seen as uh, coming from the fact that the quark and anti-quark ends radiate with spring CF, not by NC over 2. So everything is great. We come to the conclusion that perturbative and non-perturbative physics agree on the important role of keeping track of color flow in an event. And I think that's one of the, uh, the nice conclusions we learned about QCD. And in their case, they then also proposed that you could study that by comparing three pattern events, either with the quark, or either with the gluon or with the photon. And then the photon it would, in fact, give you more production between the quark and the quark because of the color flow. And that was then confirmed. Now, this effect of introducing a perturbative description for the color flow. Uh, bounced back, it started in Lund, went to Leningrad, and it came back to Lund, where Gösta Gustafsson then proposed that why not formulate the partner cascade in terms of dipole branchings. So instead of you know, saying that the quark and anti-quark radiate separately, you think of it as an antenna in the QD sense, where they, by their joint action, produce a new gluon. So you have then a process where one dipole branches into two dipoles, and then each of those can branch further. Uh, this has some advantages. If you do PT-ordered emissions, actually, this also gives you coherence. So the use of theta, of angle, angular-ordered partner showers is not the only possibility. Here we have another one. And also, if you have this kind of two partners together producing a third, then you can keep all three part, all patterns on shell all the time, uh, which from a practical point of view makes a lot of bookkeeping simpler. Otherwise, it's always a big mess to shuffle momentum around to conserve everything consistently. So this kind of approach has also become very popular. So the, uh, the angular ordered and, and the dipole showers have been kind of the most commonly used frameworks until quite recently where, where other ideas have been introduced. Uh, as an aside, uh, from this study also then arose a particular representation called the Lund plane, where you just plot uh, the uh, rapidity on the horizontal axis, log pt square on the vertical axis, and then you have the original phase space for emissions from the original dipole. And then each time you emit the gluon, you kind of create a new fold out from the uh, original folds. You get some kind of origami structure with folds and folds and folds, and with some kind of fractal structure at the bottom of, of the system. Uh, this way of understanding the internal structure of JET is kind of a very hot topic these days. 
with partner shower, it becomes easy to you know, add on as many emissions as you want to, which allows you, for instance, to then give a good description of how the charge multiplicity varies from very low to very high energies, and also how you build up not just two and three jet events, but also four, five, six, and so forth, as a function of the uh, resolution scale that you're using. So by and large, E plus and minus has worked out quite well, uh, the one interesting, not yet resolved issue is what happens with uh, W plus W minus. There, we in principle produce them and decay them almost on top of each other. So this means that you can wonder, do those two string systems exist separately or do they speak with each other? And uh, if they do, that will, of course, be, be bad news for determinations of the W mass, because then you can't use four jet events, which unfortunately was what they had to do. Uh, and unfortunately also, the effects are very small because they only affect very low momentum particles. High momentum particles near to the jet axis are not really so much affected. So it's not something that's easy to observe. Uh, nevertheless, if you uh, combine all the four experiments at the end of the lap running, then uh, you find that some kind of color reconnection is favored at about the three sigma level. And the amount of color reconnection is such that roughly half the time it happens and half the time it doesn't happen. So uh, this is something that definitely is an issue that we want to see more about in the future. But with that, I conclude with the plus and minus and now move on to PP, where life is a lot tougher. Uh, we have everything that we had in E plus and minus, but we have so much more. We have initial state radiation. Since we have higher energies, we also need to worry about more showers, maybe weak showers. Uh, and also, we have much more overlap between different things happening, going on. Like, for instance, we can have one hard interaction, but we can also have several further softer interactions just because hadrons are composite objects. So you have several partner paths that can collide separately from each other and produce a more busy environment with lots more things going on. Um, so it's much more of a challenge to build a generator for, for these kind of purposes. Nevertheless, it's surprising that already in 1980, the uh, Isabel generator was begun by Frank Page and Chirban Porto Popescu, and was used for, I, I would say, the first 10 years almost exclusively. Uh, but as I say, it is a big challenge. And it was really put to the test very early on when uh, UA1 when, uh, started to uh, study events, for instance, monojet events. So it was shown that the, uh, the kind of isajet generator was doing a great job of understanding why in dijet events you would have some momentum imbalance from both physics aspects and detector aspects. And that was also understood when you look at small momentum imbalances event with, with just one jet and nothing on the other side. But there was this uncomfortable tale of a few events sitting out here. And they were kind of suggested to be signals of uh, supersymmetry. Uh, at the end of the day, it was a set of people that showed that in fact it's coming from a set of different processes that each of them gives a very small contribution, but taken together is perfectly fine to uh, describe the, the data. Uh, there was also a top 40 GV top signal that eventually also went away. So I would say that the early days we didn't really have neither the generators nor the experience with using generators to really uh, manage everything. Uh, hopefully, we are a bit better prepared today, but you'll see later on that there have been surprises. Uh, the three main generators now are Pythia, which springs from the Lund string studies, uh, Herwig, which started with the uh, angular order showers, 
and Sherpa, which started somewhat later from matrix element generator technology. But over the years, they've kind of evolved, so they have to contain more or less the same physics, but still with sufficient variations that comparing them is a good way of checking that you don't uh, do something stupid. So we really need several uh, generators. And I should say that each of them really corresponds to multi-year, multi-person efforts and also requires continuous uptaking because you all the time have new generation of physicists that need to be explained what's going on and need to, to understand that. So we all the time get questions. Uh, now, a few examples of physics that we have seen that were maybe not completely obvious, but still not uh, also completely un expected. One of them was multi-partner interactions. That kind of was something that uh, was started to be formulated dated around 85, uh, where you have, well, based on older idea, the concept that, again, protons are composite. You can have several collisions happening with each other. In fact, since you have T-channel gluon exchange, naively speaking, you have an infinite divergent process for P-T going to zero, part and part of scatterings. Uh, that you then have to say that this doesn't work. I mean, we have to have some lower cutoff, maybe some kind of, you know, uh, after all, it, normal perturbation theory is based on an assum assumption of asymptotic free incoming states, asymptotic free outgoing states. We don't have that. We have confined part and sitting inside hadrons. So there should be some kind of uh, screening size that is kind of the distance between a, a color charge and its opposite inside a proton that kind of, its inverse is something like a uh, cutoff. And then you can either choose that to be a sharp cutoff or some kind of smooth uh, transition. Whichever way you come out with a result that you need an effective cutoff at LHC energies of around three GeV, and with that, on the average, you see about three to four collisions per event. And those collisions are absolutely essential to describe all kinds of properties that you can observe in PP collisions. The most obvious one is the uh, multiplicity distribution. One single interaction, even if it's a very hard one, will not really give you the width towards very high multiplicities and occasionally also to low ones. And also you have cases where you have forward-backward correlations where if you have much activity in vent over here, you also have much activity over there. That corresponds to having some kind of global quantum number for PP collisions. And one such number is exactly the number of MPIs. Uh, there was also early on an uh, interesting observation called the pedestal effect where you uh, noted that if you have an event with a jet or a W or a Z, something that's hard, then the activity in those events, also away from the interaction itself, is much higher than in the bias events. Uh, one particular study illustrating this with more recent data is uh, this case where you trigger on the presence of a jet in one region so you don't look there, then you also don't look opposite because there you expect to have an opposite jet, but you do look in the two transverse regions, and then you study how much activity that those regions contain as a function of your triggering jet activity. And what's interesting is that there's a very rapid rise at the beginning. In part, you could say this is because of you know, the triggering jet itself starting out with small pt. But actually, most of the effect that you observe here is coming from a change of bias that you go from having very peripheral proton-proton collisions to having very central ones. Uh, and that's, that it's not a perturbative phenomenon is quite nicely illustrated by the fact that after something like 10 GeV, all curves turn out more or less to be flat. So it's not that the hard jet is kind of leaking activity into the transverse regions. It's really coming from the impact parameter picture. Uh, 
So that's kind of also an interesting observation that impact parameter is not only for heavy ion collisions, it's something that happens already in PP interactions. And a third example of physics that we have to deal with in PP interactions is uh, the effect of color reconnections. I already mentioned that in connection with W plus W minus, but also early on it was observed, and again here showed with later data, that if you compare events where you have a low charge multiplicity with ones where you have high charge multiplicity, the average PT of charged particles is increasing, larger with large multiplicity. And if you think about MPIs as being, you know, just more of the same, one interaction is the same as having two, just twice as much, and 10 is just 10 times as much, then of course you would say that high multiplicity is dominated by many MPIs, but each of them have the same, so why should the average PT increase? Uh, the obvious explanation that you have for the experimental behavior is in fact that when you have many MPIs, you have lots of strings sitting on top of each other. And then my, maybe nature feels that why should I, you know, have strings running around like that when I can shortcut things a bit. And if you do that, then you produce fewer hadrons, but you still have the petit kicks of the interaction themselves. So you have more petit to share between fewer hadrons, and that gives you then the observed behavior. In this plot, you also have one model that does not have color reconnection, then you see it's almost completely flat. So this is again something that we learn about nature that something like that seems to be going on. So overall, I would say that today we have lots of stuff that we can describe in PP collisions, and uh, in particular the perturbative framework I think is very well under control. Okay, you want to calculate higher orders, but it's not any kind of fundamental issue that we are worried about there. However, there is some bit of disappointment that uh, we would have hoped that our fragmentation models, call them string or cluster fragmentation, once we've taken into account the more busy environment of PP, should still work just out of the box for LHC. That's what we would call jet universality. Unfortunately, over the years, we've now seen that there are specific cases where this does not seem to be the case. And I'm going to, to discuss next three such examples. So the first is strangeness enhancement, that you have uh, more strange particle production, particularly more multi-strange baryon production in events with high activity in general, that is high uh, multiplicity for charged particles. And the rise is quite spectacular, and it seems as if the uh, PP data then nicely attaching to PA and then AA data. So it's kind of almost as if you have some kind of quark gluon plus may be produced already in PP collisions. Uh, so that is then, you know, one question that you ask. Of course, we've been taught in our test textbooks that uh, PP collisions don't have the volume and don't have the time to produce the plasma. Uh, so that's a question. Nevertheless, you have here two models that kind of try to at least have some contact with the data, not perfect, but still better than default Pythia, which is almost completely flat. And one of those, which in fact is still before the LHC data, is taking this concept of quark gluon plasma seriously. So it's assumed that whatever kind of collision process you have, you do produce lots of strings, and they are tightly uh, packed. Now, if they're very tightly packed, like in the center of an AA collision, they simply will melt away, and you get your plasma, and you do hydro on that, and produce hadrons that way. Whereas if you have uh, low multiplicity PP events, then you still have a few strings, but they are sufficiently spaced apart that they won't melt. You will have a normal string picture, you will have something like E plus E minus, and then in between, you will have a mixture of those two components, which kind of explains the natural transition from E plus E minus to AA when you study PP events. 
that's something implemented in the APOS Monte Carlo, which is another set of generators that I haven't been discussing, but kind of more interest in heavy ion collision, cosmic ray collisions, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are also other ways. If you don't like uh, plasma, you could also imagine that what's happening is that when several strings sit on top of each other, part of the time they fuse into something called rope, where you have a higher color representation, and therefore the string tension is higher, and therefore the normal suppression of strangeness production is reduced, so you get more strangeness, you also get more baryons, and that again is something that more or less describes the data, but, but it's still not perfect, uh, and there are kind of other shortcomings of this thing here. Uh, another interesting observation is uh, that we now see a charm bear enhancement. So in particular, if you look at uh, here, the composition of charmed hadrons, then for lambda sub c, lep data, and, uh, hera data, and so on sit down here. The measurements at uh, LHC sit up here, a factor three or four higher. So certainly something did change when you went from E plus and minus to PP here. And the same is true for all kinds of, uh, of charm variants. Again, there are models, and at least one of them was proposed for the data. So if you compare here with different models, then default Pythia is sitting down here, but variants of it are sitting up here, not too far away from the data. And what's being done here is that you introduced uh, something that was already mentioned earlier today, namely junctions. You say that in addition to normal color reconnection, you could also have the possibility that two, you know, two quarks here and two antiquarks here could reduce the total string length by having an you know, antitriplet in the middle. So you get then a baryon and an antibaryon that add to the normal production of baryons. And in particular, for a centrally produced charm quarks, it's easier to be caught up in a baryon number this way here than the normal way of producing baryons. So uh, this model, in fact, then uh, does, as I say, a decent job. Also with uh, cluster models, you can have this kind of where three quark, anti-quark uh, clusters combine into one only con containing quarks and one only containing anti-quarks, and then you kind of have similar phenomena going on there. So if we then look at the data, we will see that as a function of PT, uh, these models here describe the data that it's happening at small PT, which is the region where we have many strings overlapping with each other. Uh, and then we go to higher PT, then even the uh, kind of old default non-functional model starts to touch uh, base with the data itself. So what we conclude is that probably at higher PT, we really get to a picture where hadronization is happening in some kind of vacuum, and E plus and minus phenomenology is recovered, but at low PT, it's not. Uh, so that looks great for lambda sub c. Unfortunately, when we go on, in particular when we look at uh, xi sub c, then even this kind of uh, junction model does actually not come up to the data. It's, they are sitting uh, down here. So they are not at all in agreement with the data. So there's more work to be done, uh, but at least it's something that, that we may have some idea what's going on. And just as a small side comment, we also have seen a similar enhancement for beauty variants. So the same thing seems to occur for there as it does for charm. Uh, since I th I'm running out of time, I will kind of maybe skip this thing here, but just to say that uh, you do observe asymmetries, uh, whoops, uh, between uh, lambda sub b and lambda sub b bar in the uh, forward direction in rapidity, 
And that you can relate to uh, the fact that you have an asymmetric system. You have protons, not antiprotons, uh, equally much. And uh, what one finds is that um, actually the, uh, the level is here rather independent of PT in the data, whereas the naive old models would have said that you have more of a, this kind of asymmetry pull mechanism from the proton remnants at low PT. But that's in fact now, if we believe the model, canceled by the enhancement of other production mechanisms for charm and bottom variants at small PT. And then finally, I will mention the rich effect that we observe some kind of flow, not only in AA events, but also in PP events. And uh, that again forces us to think what's going on there. One suggestion has been that you have these ten strings and maybe they repel each other so that that way you get some kind of collective flow also in PP. But that's even more speculative than, than some of the other stuff I mentioned. So to summarize, there are many things that I have not covered. One big chunk will be covered by Stefan Hersche towards the end of this meeting. Uh, he will discuss all the new things about perturbation theory that you have included at uh, the LHC. That means perturbative higher order calculation. It means more advanced partner shower algorithms. And it also involves how you combine the matrix elements and the partner showers in a consistent manner. So those three aspects are, in some sense, probably what has dominated the development of generators the last 20 years. But uh, I think that it's nice that we can share the work between ourselves. Um, and then there are many topics that I've not been able to, to uh, cover at all. I should mention, however, just for fun, that we have topics like, for instance, uh, people discuss that dark matter may be some kind of hidden valley scenario where you then would have lots of different particles. And then we can start to do partner showers and hadronizations in this hidden valley sector, which is great fun. Uh, but OK, to summarize, I hope I've illustrated that we, in fact, have used generators as a very important tool when we have strived to confirm the basic properties of QCD, like uh, you know, quark and gluon spins, color factors, running of alpha strong, and so on and so forth. But we have also learned things that maybe are not obvious just by staring at the Lagrangian, like, for instance, that perturbative evolution is uh, strongly influenced by coherence, and that confinement leads to hadronization along color lines that are, you know, almost perfectly consistent with the NC goes to infinity limit. Uh, we've also seen that multipart interactions and color reconnections are very crucial tools for building up the structure of PP collisions. And that we still have a number of issues that we don't fully understand that seem to break jet universality. So that is kind of the bottom line that are still a number of topics we don't understand where people are working on it. It's maybe not as topical as next leading order calculation, but we are still a few enthusiasts worrying about topics like that. Uh, and in summary, I would say there doesn't exist a complete unified picture. Uh, some people would argue that, for instance, APOS could be some such unified model. I'm not completely convinced, but this is for the future to tell. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Questions? So thank you for that very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, you talked about the color ropes, and you yeah. talked about string shoving. And yeah. how do the strings decide whether they're going to uh, uh, fuse into ropes or uh, have a repulsive interaction? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, 
And uh, the people who have produced these two models are actually partly the same people. So they still have not been able to combine these two components into one consistent framework. But you would probably say that, that what you need to, to imagine is that uh, you have some shove at the very early times and then by the time you start to hadronize, they will have not been able to shove enough and then you will still have some kind of ropes that, that do the hadronization. But yes, no, uh, this is one of these issues that we discuss. I mean, when will you have a ready a model that really tries to do everything at the same time? Uh, it's complicated. On Monday, uh, Professor Al-Hadra described your fourth point as one of the flagships of the uh, lattice gauge theory program, of uh, quantum chromodynamic program of the past 50 years. IAN's determination using Jade and uh, um, using Petra data, Jade and Tasso data, has differed from the lattice quantum chromodynamic determination by more than three sigma for over a decade. If you look at the particle data group summary from 2009, we had better precision than after IAN's uh, determination. Uh, I wonder if you could take us back to that confusion in 1982 and tell us about the logic of it. It's, it seemed like you skipped a step. It's, there was something between the two Petra detectors. We found a graduate student, we fired him in, at DESI. But there was this cello experiment. You phrased the, con the conflict in terms of two names, uh, yeah. Hoyer and uh, well, Lund is not yeah. a name, it's a city. Mm -hmm. But could you talk about the cello experiment and how that resolution worked out? Did they just fire everyone at cello? No, no. I mean, Cello did, did the right thing. I mean, they noticed that models were not doing the same stuff. I mean, so you, they noted that there is a difference if you take the Hoyer Monte Carlo, if you take Lund Monte Carlo, fitting the same data, you get two different alpha strong numbers. And uh, I, I tried to explain why these two models, in fact, in one case make events more two jet like, in another case make them more three jet like, even if you start out from exactly the same partonic configuration. And that's why the alpha strong values drift apart. But then after that, you have to decide which is the model that really is consistent with, with, with data. And there the confusion was, as I said, that Tasso had a bug. I don't think anybody was fired for that reason. I think that the people involved had great careers in, in particle physics afterward. So that, that's not a problem. But they uh, kind of, and, and I should say, Tasso never published it. They just told us that, sorry, we, we like that you're interested in, in uh, petrophysics, but our, your model doesn't work for us. So uh, <laughs> they never published, they were never mean to us. Uh, but uh, then eventually they found the bug and then, then things resolved. So you write it that color re reconnection are needed so you have color reconnection already also in perturbation theory. So uh, do you have some information that how much is the perturbative part and how much is the non-perturbative? Uh, no, I don't. And I don't know whether anybody can really do a good job, for instance. Well, I mean, for, for the case of two Ws, there, in fact, you can do a kind of perturbative calculation. And that, that was uh, Valeria and I worked on. Valeria did a perturbative calculation, came up with that could at most be a 5 MeV effect on the W mass. So that, that part is, in fact, under control because if you try to change the W mass, you, sh you push the propagators off shell and then kind of you, uh, you um, suppress the cross section. Uh, but for, um, for you know, hadronic events where you have uh, you know, 20 strings on top of each other, how can you do a perturbative calculation there? <laughs> so light front wave functions describe how hadrons couple to the quarks and gluons and so on. And it's, it's a sum over all the different Fox states. So is, is this being included now in the, uh, in the hadronization models that you're discussing? Uh, no, it's not. Because that's, there's really a tremendous progress on this from light frontalography and so on. Mm. And then, of course, you also get higher Fox states with, with extra CC bar, SS bar, and then mm -hmm. asymmetric and CNC bar and so on. No, so, I agree with you that although we, we have a few multiplets included, then uh, clearly 
there are many things more that we could do, and we could also could kind of worry about tetra quarks and pentra exactly tetra quarks and stuff like that. There have been some some attempts at that, but more like molecular states than really like oh. uh, you know fundamental topological quantities. I think it's an important new direction we could look at. Okay.